In early June 2024, a young mother found herself driving to a car park in West Wales. It was not a journey she had intended to make. Indeed, nothing about her life for the past couple of weeks had been expected. Everything had been turned upside down. Hunted by large, dark shadows, the inexplicable appearance of scratches and acid-like burns on her skin, even her sleep had been disrupted. Subjected to a sudden and ever-escalating carnival of horror, she blamed her bizarre and terrifying experiences on an item that had recently entered her home. A seemingly innocuous glass cloche purchased new to house a personal memento. She had already tried and failed to rid herself of the object. It was almost as though it wanted to stay, a mind of its own determined to remain in her life and cause her more suffering. But now she had found someone to relieve her. Recommended to her by a mutual connection, the couple had offered to take the object from her. All she had to do was meet them in the car park. The menacing cloche and the mysterious claw marks which tarnished its glass surface sitting in the boot of her car. My name is Laura, and this is the true story of how I came to own a very strange and unsettling item indeed. This is not like the other stories I have presented on this channel. I did not read about this happening in a book, neither did I learn of it via a documentary, interview or news story. This testimony and the item it concerns were given to me in person by a very scared individual. Other than our brief informal interview and the actual handing over of the object, she wanted nothing more to do with the case. While she gave permission to my husband Eric and I to talk about her experiences, she requested her identity be kept a secret. And so, for the purpose of this narration, I shall refer to her as Bethan, a false name for a true story. A very true story. For after taking possession of the glass cloche, Eric and I also went on to experience odd and at their worst plainly horrifying happenings. Others who have had a chance to interact with the item whilst visiting its new home, Eric and I's brand new paranormal museum, have likewise reported strangeness. But before we speak of recent events, let us start at the beginning, with Bethan, and how it was that she came to possess the item now known as the Gwithki. The small glass bell jar came from an online retailer, purchased by Bethan, a young mother from West Wales, for the purpose of displaying a personal memento, it ought to have been like any other brand new item, fresh, impersonal, undamaged. And yet, when it arrived at her home, Bethan was disappointed to discover a series of scratch marks on the surface of the glass. Given the purpose of the object, decorative display, the tarnishes undermined the reason why she had bought it, and so she contacted the seller requesting a refund or replacement. The seller, however, was obstinate, refusing to do either, arguing that the item would have been unmarked when they sent it to her, and thus was not their responsibility. Not wanting to waste any more energy on the matter than she already had done, Bethan put the blemished cloche to one side and continued on with her life. That very same night, Bethan alleged to have experienced the first in a series of nightmares that would ultimately lead her to dispose of the object. In it, she was sitting on a chair in a dimly lit wooden cabin. There was, so she later described during her informal interview, an open fire and a doorway. She was facing the door when it opened, a large wolf-like figure rushing through it. Described as having been half man and half wolf, Bethan remained in the chair as the hairy bipedal terror moved towards her. The wolfman then opened his large canine jaws and, in one bite, severed the young woman's head from her body. The dream ended at this point, with Bethan waking absolutely terrified. As traumatic as the nightmare was for the young mother, she thought little of it in that moment. Everyone, after all, has bad dreams. And yet, disruption to her sleep continued, with, over the next few days, the horror seemingly entering waking life also, in the form of large shadows and other visual anomalies that began to manifest in her house. She would catch sight of them most often when she was home alone. 
One especially frightening anecdote, however, took place when she was driving. According to her testimony, a glimpse in the vehicle's mirrors led her to witness a dark and fast dog-like shape running behind her car, down the middle of the road. Bethan was certain to state that there were no other vehicles on the road at that time, and that her sighting occurred in daylight hours. Despite it being a rural area, there was, as far as she was concerned, no natural explanation for the animalistic apparition that she saw sprinting behind her on the road. And so she was, in her own words, being hunted. Aggressive and seemingly canine in nature, whatever was responsible continued to affect her sleep, with both the frequency and intensity of her nightmares increasing day by day. The themes of the restless dreams were always the same. Violent wolves, black dogs, werewolves, red-eyed, canine-featured chimeras. She even claimed, albeit briefly and unsure, that oftentimes before she fell asleep, she would experience physical sensations. Strange scratches on her skin and what she called acid burns. When Eric and I met her that day in early June, she did not dwell on this, and seeing how clearly affected she was by the conversation, we did not feel it was appropriate or helpful to push her to reveal any more. And so it was, within the course of a mere two weeks, Bethan's life was destabilized beyond imagining. It was around this time that she rediscovered the glass cloche. Until that point, it, along with its scratched surface, had sat forgotten in her home. The conversation with the online retailer had led nowhere, the item thus losing its decorative purpose. When she picked it up, intending finally to dispose of it, she felt a rush of horror. Eyes transfixed on the damaged surface, the scratches took on a whole new and terrifying significance. They were claw marks. Canine, wolf-like claw marks. Not only that, the strange and frightening activity, nightmares and physical attacks she had experienced for the past two weeks had only started once the object entered her home. Bethan was thus convinced that the glass cloche, with its claw marks etched into its very surface, was somehow responsible. Chilled, she taped the bell jar shut and left it outside, on the pavement beyond the boundary of her home, for the bin men to remove along with the other waste that was scheduled to be collected. When bin day came, however, the glass cloche wasn't taken. For some unknown reason, it was left at Bethan's home, despite the rest of the recycling waste being removed. It is at this point in Bethan's story that Eric and I became involved. A mutual connection, a tradesperson with whom Eric had spoken about our work in the paranormal, knew that the young mother was struggling, and so suggested that she might like to phone us and get us to help. Our phone number was given, a call was made, and it was agreed that we would meet Bethan at a mutually convenient and anonymous location, a car park in West Wales. Everything went according to plan. We met, she told us about her experiences, we offered words of advice, then we parted ways. She without the glass cloche, Eric and I, its new owners. Artifacts with strange histories are nothing new to Eric and I. We have been collecting for years, both items of purely historic significance and those with uniquely bizarre backstories. And yet, less than a week after taking possession of the glass cloche, I came to realize that it was highly abnormal, even amongst abnormal items. Before opening our new paranormal museum in Carmarthen, Wales, Eric and I kept the more active and potentially problematic of our collection at home, in a special storeroom located inside an outbuilding on our property. There, the objects unique and special needs could be catered to without interfering with our living, working and sleeping areas. 99% of the time, this was a more than adequate arrangement. Bethan's glass cloche was the exception, the 1%. The only item I have ever felt the need to remove from our property and store elsewhere. After taking the cloche home and securing it in our storeroom, both Eric and I began to experience phenomena similar to that which Bethan had reported to us during our car park meeting. Shadows, disrupted sleep, that by itself might have been resolvable. Then one day, I went into the storeroom by myself. There, I experienced sudden, severe pain in my abdomen. It felt like I had been slashed across my middle by something sharp and acidic. After that, I knew that keeping the item at home was no longer an option. 
It risked further aggressive activity towards myself or someone else, or even an unsettling of the other objects in our care. That same afternoon, Eric and I bagged it and removed it to a safe place away from our home. At that time, still shocked by experiencing the physical sensation across my abdomen, I cared little if I ever saw that cloche again. When we took possession of our museum building in August, only a couple of months after being given the mysterious item by Bethan, we returned to retrieve it and move it to the museum, which is now its permanent home. It is a very cold and bad weather day in summertime Wales. And I am at, oh, <laughs> it was a squirrel <laughs> running on the church roof. Okay, I'm at a, uh, a graveyard that I know very well to retrieve an item, a pro very problematic item that I have had to store here whilst we wait, whilst we waited to take possession of um, the museum. So I really didn't want this one at home. So, uh, like I said, I, this is a place that I frequent often and particularly the older graves. Well, uh, quite a few graveyards in the local area. I like to go to them, show, pay my respects, read from the headstones, acknowledge the people who are resting there particularly those who no longer get visitors and say prayers for them and that's something that I've done for years so when I this item came into my possession it's not something that I wanted at home so this particular graveyard I have a special connection to and I asked the spirits of the graveyard the keepers of the graveyards to do me a favor I suppose and take care of this item until I could come back and retrieve it, which is what I'm doing now. Okay. Just have to remember where I put it. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. St. Michael, Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power, thrust into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Bless you, Michael. I've got it. We call the glass cloche the Gwithgi, the Welsh term for a supernatural black dog or hellhound. Similar to the more commonly known black shook of English legend, this mythical beast is described by those who allege to have encountered them to be incredibly vicious a canine creature with fiery eyes that howls at night, searching for prey. Celtic tradition swarms with tales of this dog of darkness, with the folkloric animal most especially associated with lonely rural roads, much like Bethan's reported encounter with the dark and fast dog-like shape she saw whilst driving her car. While such myths might come across as fanciful and difficult to believe, it must be stressed that there are a surprising number of these reports of wolfish creatures in the present day. According to Mark Rees, a prominent Welsh author and folklorist, one such modern Gwithki encounter took place on the south coast of Carmarthenshire, not far from our very own Routens Museum, at the Corran Resort and Spa. The case centred on a night security guard who alleged to have become completely paralysed after taking a quick nap in one of the hotel's rooms. According to the man's testimony, he was trapped within his body by a huge black thing in the room with him. It supposedly resembled an oversized black Alsatian dog. 
After baring its teeth at the frozen security guard, the creature swiftly disappeared. Oddly, other employees at the now-closed resort are also reported to have encountered the hellhound. One woman even alleged to have fled from the resort as fast as she was able after seeing the beast run across the bar one night. And so Wales, it seems, is teeming with hellish black dogs. As for the glass cloche Gwithki housed at Routon's museum, we are still attempting to unravel precisely how it came to be. During our car park conversation with Bethan, she hinted, although did not elaborate upon, how she believes someone in her personal life may have done this to her. A curse of sorts. Whether that was the ritualistic black magic binding of an etheric hellhound to an item, the projection of the evil eye, or even a canine tulpa creation sent to torment her by an enemy, it cannot be said. Here, consideration of the esoteric double might prove profitable, the traditional folk and shamanic concept that suggests we all have the ability to unlock at least one other version of ourselves. This other version can be human or animal, physical or ethereal. And that is not necessarily even to say that someone somewhere right now is astrally projecting themselves inside a glass cloche in the strange territory of the paranormal that someone might not even be in the material. They might not even be human. All that can be said is that for Bethan, the anonymous young mother who hurried to relieve herself of the item, the vicious, wolf-like creature which hunted her days and haunted her nights, was very real as were the things that Eric and I experienced in the aftermath, most especially the physical feeling of being attacked. For now, the item is contained at our Museum of the Paranormal, with a special regime of spiritual care regularly performed on and around its locked case. Even so, early visitors to the museum have already reported strangeness in its proximity, including words like hound and instructions to run away, having come through various word bank and spirit box devices and applications. Unease is common, especially in the dark. Given that Routon's museum is very soon to open, with our first guided tours and seance evenings in our purpose-built Victorian-themed seance parlour scheduled for the 26th of October onwards, I imagine there will be other reports of similar activity. And so, at this point, I extend an invitation to any and all who dare to come and help Eric and I investigate not only the Gwithki, but the other items in our collection this Halloween. There are still tickets available for our Halloween Paranormal Investigation, which you can purchase online via our website. Not only is it a chance for you to meet Eric and I, but also to have a tour of our artefacts and special building. And, regardless of your experience level, to experience the paranormal for yourselves on the spookiest night of the year. As for the Gwithki, we cannot make any promises. You shall simply, as I always encourage you to do, have to decide for yourself what to believe. Thank you so much for watching. I truly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to show more support for the work that Eric and I do, I implore you to visit our new Routens Museum website, sign up to our newsletter there, and follow our social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're at a loose end this Halloween, why not join us for a six-hour investigation of our museum? We're also hosting seance evenings and guided tours, with tickets now available to book online via our website. Thank you again. I wish you a safe and happy Halloween. And for those of you who've already booked your tickets, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Until next time, 